All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to uh, to FPNA Fridays. Happy to uh, happy to have everyone here. I'm uh, super excited for uh, for today's conversation. Uh, I've got with me uh, Glenn Snyder from Global Growth, head of FPNA, and also uh, as usual Chris Ortega from Amasis. Uh, you're looking after FPNA and all things finance over there. Welcome, Chris. Welcome, Glenn. What's going on? Well, we're just, uh, Chris, I think you're on mute on the clubhouse there, so you might want to uh, course correct that one quickly. Um, but it's an amazing Friday. I, I, uh, I've got some really fun stuff going on. We're really excited about, um, about the upcoming weekend. I'm going to take my kids swimming. Um, we're, we've just, you know, it's a beautiful sunny day again here in California, as always. Chris, how's it out there in Indy? Uh, Rowan, uh, it's, uh, so this week we've had like four different weather phenomenons. We've had, uh, it's been, it's been all four seasons in the span of two days. So Indiana is all over the place right now. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the beauty of, uh, of spring sometimes. Glenn, how are you? Uh, doing well. Thank you. Um, I'm actually, I hope by the way, if you're going to go swimming, uh, you need to go down Saturday. we're going to get rain on Sunday. Rare rain in Northern California in April. Ah, oh, I haven't noticed. I don't check the weather. It's just expect sunny and uh, you get sunny. That's just generally how I, I operate my life. Uh, all right, guys. <laughs> well, um, you know, we've got a really fun uh, fun conversation today. I know we were talking offline and we were thinking about uh, two two major topics. And, and I actually think they're intertwined. So I'd love to get your, your perspectives. But number one, Chris, you wanted to talk about, you know, how finance can help uh, create, shape and maintain a high performance culture in, in, inside of a company. And Glenn, one of the things you wanted to talk about was um, was forecast frequency and, and, you know, how you manage a business, whether it's off the forecast, off the budget, off the plan. And I actually think that those two things, as, as surprising as this may say, and collide because if I think about high performing organizations, they're always course correcting and they're always <laughs> adapting and and the the way that they're doing that is using forecast frequency and uh, using different techniques in the way that they look at their plan because you know what they created uh, on an annual planning basis may not be how the company is performing right now, especially in high growth, high performing organizations. So, let's uh, let's kick things off. Um, let's start with you, Chris. I think you you really wanted to talk about this high performing culture. Tell me about how you believe finance and FPNA can can create and shape a high performing culture. Yeah, I think it's always an interesting topic uh, to talk about accounting finance and FP&A as it relates to company culture, right? Uh, it's usually not very synonymous that you think about a finance or accounting or CFO leader uh, being a culture carry inside of an organization. But I think in you know high growth entrepreneur, very fast paced companies, definitely right now in the situation that we're in, finance has to be connected to the people, right? You have to be connected to the people. You have to be a, a influencer of the culture, right? And all, ultimately, what I've always seen is you have culture carriers, you have culture influencers, and you have culture participants, right? And everybody has a different persona. There's a different value proposition everybody brings to that conversation. But for me, company culture as it relates to accounting, finance, and FP&A, we have a critical piece of it, right? Because it gets back to something that I think is near and dear to me. Uh, that every accounting finance CFO VP of finance should be thinking about, and that's the that's this uh, uh, empathetic data driven decision making, right? And that's how you take in people's understanding, their listening, their feedback, how you understand all those different qualitative aspects that come around from people to incorporate those in your quantitative models. So for me, like I've always been a culture carrier and a culture influencer inside of organizations that I've been a part of, right? And I look, I'm not asking all the listeners, I'm not telling you guys that you have to go out and talk to everybody and schedule lunches and everything like that, but you have to be connected to the culture, right? You have to be able to understand what is your company culture? What is the company, what is the culture of your accounting finance FP&A team and how you all work together to, to ultimately drive the results that you need inside the business. So for me, that's always been something really, really important. And it's, 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 it's typically under the radar for a lot of uh, CFOs and VPs of thinking about. 
Um, but it's also it's, it's equally as important as all the forecasting, the modeling, the risk, the strategic planning that we do is the, the connection to the people and connection to the culture. And so, Glenn, maybe uh, maybe this is a question for you. When you think about um, culture and how you can shape that environment, what techniques do you think finance can own and run to actually go and shape and influence that? Finance <coughs> actually has a huge impact on culture in a way that most finance people don't even think about it because we control the spend or we can influence the spend. And... One of the things that, I, and I, by the way, first let me back up, 100% agree with what Chris said, because there are people who are influencers and there are people who are more participants, and I would even say maybe culture leaders. And you know, one of the things when you go in, if you're running an FP&A team, you want to go have that conversation with the CFO to say, what kind of culture do you want to have at this company? What kind of culture do you want us to be driving to make sure that you're aligned with your executive leadership? But one of the things that you want to drive, FP&A finance really drives accountability, transparency. We have direct influence on that, where we get to go and tell our business partners, hey, look, here's what you said you're going to spend. Here's what you're actually doing. Let's make sure you're going to stay within those boundaries that, that you set out. Or if you need to go above it, let's make sure you get the right approvals rather than just having the Wild West and people doing whatever they want. And that culture that, that, that finance can really drive is really going to be around that transparency, discipline, and accountability. And that is actually very key in what finance's role actually is. Because well, I'll give you a really great example. When I first started at, at Digital Realty, we built out a corporate FP&A team from scratch. The company would go out, they would spend money, they would do different things before we got there. There wasn't any reporting, there wasn't conversations that finance was having with the business. After the first year I was there, the CFO walked into my office and said, Glenn, you know, this is the first time we've ever actually managed under our budget for GNA. And it wasn't because I was doing anything that spectacular it was just that I was talking with the business leaders. I was sharing the information. I was making sure that they understood where they were and where they said they would be. And then I was able to go and take that conversation and share that with the executives so they knew where the businesses stood. This way, if they wanted to have a conversation with their direct reports, they could. And that transparency changed the culture from one of, hey, you know what? I need to do something. I'm just going to go spend the money. <coughs> The executives are going to see if I'm over budget. No, no, no. I don't want to see that. I want to go and make sure I'm managing within that. So that to me is such a key part of FPNA. It's not just about the analysis. Yeah, you got to get the numbers right. You got to go and you got to do the right analysis. But it's the communication and the impact on culture that really helps change companies. 100%. Yeah, I, I, I can't agree more uh, either. I think, you know, we've all we've all probably been at uh, at companies where finance and we've talked about it on, on various episodes of, of this show, the scorekeeper mentality, right? That influences a specific culture within an organization which uh, can often lead to people, you know, maybe let's let's talk about, you know, back to Chris's point, high-performing organizations, right? High-performing organizations are generally really looking to grow rapidly. They're really looking to, to invest. And if you've got a finance organization that is following a scorekeeping mentality, what you can actually create there is a modality within the business which makes them afraid to spend money which is not linked with the company strategy of rapid, 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 rapid growth, right? Um, and not one of thinking about, well, how do I get the best ROI? How do I make the best use of this investment? And that's where the, the partnering side of, of FP&A comes in place. And, and so, Chris, you, you've been at an organization growing through that rapid growth, right? <laughs> Especially in North America. Talk to me about how you've leveraged specific techniques, like back to back to Glenn's point, right? You know, forecast frequency. How have you used specific FP&A techniques to actually influence that culture and influence the way that you want the company's culture and, and growth to, to manifest? Yeah, and, and you know, given that's a great question. And given my background in high growth, entrepreneurial, high performance uh, technology companies, that has always been one of the, the models that we brought to organizations. So, I mean, I got countless examples. One of them I wanna share is 
with the previous company I was at, um, you know, one of the things that was around company culture was just that nobody kind of knew, uh, you know, where their career pathing was going. No one kind of knew uh, what their development opportunity was. There wasn't training involved with stuff. And it was it was primarily a focus and at the time, right? Like a lot of times we don't have like that chief people officer or like that dedicated people resource. We just, you know, we're scrappy and a lot of people just wear a lot of different hats. And one of the one of the things we went down was working with a great partner to help us around a human capital roadmap. Like literally for every role opportunity, we align career development, training opportunities, compensation. We aligned all that to uh, people's qua uh, qualitative focus and what they wanted in their career to the overall objectives of the company. So when you talk about that traditional financial planning and analysis hat that a lot of finance people wear, right? That's the analysis. That's the data insights. That's the scenario planning. That's the outcome. That's the feedback loop of you know going to strategy, getting feedback, persevering or pivot on that strategy. A lot of those different things that are our bread and butter, you can apply that to people strategies. You can apply that to operational strategies. Uh, another example that I had is working with our client success group here at Amarsis, right? One of the things that was really in understanding the people and understanding our culture of high performance, like one of our values is like we never settle and we love our customers, right? And the client success group and our implementation group being in software, they were like, really, really champion. And I seen that they always talked about net promoter score from projects. And I always seen that they talked about the number of projects completed. Like they got excited, they got happy, they got passionate about it. But for them, it was it was nowhere being, it, it was being tracked in their group. But I can tell that this was a group that really loved the shot spotlight on them because sales have transitioned the deal. They've implemented the product. They are really on the front line of, of having that great customer experience. So in working with that group, I said, OK, how can I be a champion for you to amplify the message and, and the KPIs and the commitments that this high performing team is committing? That way we can monitor it when we can celebrate when they're doing well or we can expect when we miss gaps. Right. So that was really getting down with the team and helping them connect the dots to the bigger picture of this is why net promoter score matters. Right. Net promoter score. People are happy. They'll tell more people they'll buy more stuff. Right. If they buy more stuff, that drives up our dollar retention rate. If they tell more people, we get more projects for you guys to work on and we close more business, right? And and, and the, the key nuance around that, and what I think was like in both of those examples at different software companies, the key piece of that was not making it complex to connect the dots. Listen, listen, listen. Too many times, accounting and finance people, we start talking about asset impairments and like we got to amortize the, 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 the deferred revenue of the depreciation, you're going to lose people. Like one of the key things in like that cultural aspect of it that any high performance accounting finance leader has is the simplicity of connecting the dots in the complexity that let me say that again. You make what you make what's super complex, very simple for people to digest and understand. That's how quickly you do those different things. And when you're a high performing organization like we are in America's and we're responsible for, you know, being a significant part of the overall uh, uh, global business, we got it. We got to get that going. We got to instill that in it. We, and, and we got to keep marching forward in those different things. So for me, like those are the examples of where you can take a lot of those traditional quantitative, that technical expertise that we have and that you may have a part of your team. But you have to translate that to qualitative and, and people uh, uh, aspects of it as well. And when you are able to do that, right, that's when you're able to what I call being in the trenches with the business and you go through wars. Right. And I don't, I don't mean wars in a negative connotation. Right. I mean, wars that when you go through little battles together with 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 the sales group, the client success group, your implementation group, your customer support group, your marketing group. When you go through in the trench and you're in the trenches with them and you go through those battles in terms of overall culture, that's where they know, like, I know I have a partner. I know I have a person that is in the trenches with me. They have a different viewpoint, but we're all marching in the same direction. So for me, it's always being on the same path, but having different views of that path. And that's always been successful. 
Chris, yeah, thanks thanks so much for sharing that pathway. Uh, before I cut over to you, Glenn, uh, if anyone uh, in the in the clubhouse room wants to jump up and, and participate in the conversation, feel free to just raise your hand and uh, and one of us will uh, will we'll bring you up here on stage. Uh, we'd love some participation. Glenn, h- how do you see um, that high performance culture um, being shaped through the, the finance techniques that, that Chris was just talking about? Well, it all comes back to culture or sorry, communication. It, it, you know, it's whether you are a, a startup or you're an established company, it's about how you're interacting with people. You know, it's there's a fine line that we in finance have to walk. We want to make sure we're going to be supporting the business unit to help them achieve their goals. But we also, as finance people, have to keep in mind we have corporate goals that we need to achieve as well. And so it's really making sure that you're straddling that line and, you know, I've had conversations with, with business leaders where they're coming out and they're saying, hey, look, you know, we're going to need to go and do all of these things. And, you know, as a finance person, you kind of the first thing you think of is how much is that going to cost, right? And you start calculating it up, say, okay, you know, great idea. You, you know, love what you're trying to do, but you're saying we should be spending $7 million to get a $5 million return. All right, let's go back and revisit it, right? So you got to have that corporate hat on. But you have to also make sure that you're supporting them to say, let's figure out how we could go over and make this work for your business so you could achieve your goals and the corporation could get what they're looking for too. That line that you have to straddle is you're doing that every single day in every single conversation. And to be that high performing finance team, you have to live on that line because the second you go one side or the other, you're going to lose somebody. You go more on the business side, your CFO is going to say, hey, wait a second, you're not doing what I need you to do. And that's the guy who's determining your bonus and how you run your team. If you go more on the corporate side, the business people are going to say, you know what, you're not really looking out for my best interest and how I'm going to achieve my goals. So now you're not part of my trusted leadership group. You got to be there on both sides. And it is a very delicate balance. But the best way to do it is through transparency, being direct and being honest. You know, that's what everybody's looking for. Don't go over and say something because it sounds like it's the right thing to say. Say it because it's true. You know, be there with data. Be there with uh, with unbiased comments. I always talk to my team uh, at every company I've ever been at. I've always told them our role in finance is not to take sides. All of our analysis, all of our guidance needs to be unbiased. Our number one stakeholder is the owners of the company, whether they're shareholders or they're private owners or whatever. Look out for them. And if you do that, you're going to not only drive that high performing team, but you're going to drive that culture of accountability and transparency too. Definitely. I think uh, too, the, the, the common ground I found in both of what you said there is, is meeting people where they are, right? And, and that's just classic empathy, right? And, and it's not something we all learn. Um, but understanding the business, where they are, where their, where their strategy may lie, where they are fiscally, where they are with their financial IQ, where they are with their ability to actually uh, achieve their goals is, is huge because if you come into a business uh, and maybe you've already been there and, and, and you know some team is struggling and you come in and say, why aren't you doing this or why aren't you doing that? they're just going to push back on you, right? Um, and, and that's that kind of that that position where you don't want to be in. And then if you come in and you're in that scorekeeper mentality when you've got a high-performing team, one that's trying to grow really fast, again, they're going to push you away. Uh, that whole aspect of, of understanding the, the mood, the sentiment, the, the, uh, the, the kind of the emotion of the business is a huge part of shaping and influencing that culture. We we have uh, internally here at Planful, um, Grant Haller and our CEO talks about environment shapers and environment takers. Some people just uh-huh. accept the vir- environment they're in. They accept the status quo. They <clears throat> accept whatever they've received. And other folks go out there and they really try and shape and change that environment. And and that's what FP&A teams should be doing, right? They should be environment shapers, it, as we're in, like, I think we're, a lot of us have just finished a quarter, right? Um, certainly we have here. Some organizations might be, might be a, a month or so away or a few weeks away. 
Glenn, one of the things that we talked about was we're out now in three and nine mode, right? Um, and uh, and so, you know, we've had our annual plan out for three months. Everyone's a bit jazzed. Uh, you know, things in the economy are changing. How do you now take what is um, three months worth of data and three months worth of feedback, three months worth of actuals, and now go and shape the environment for an organization that could be potentially be, whoa, we're way off plan here in a good way or a bad way. Talk me through uh, how you both have, uh, have experienced some of those challenges. Yeah, you know, every time you do a forecast, it's, it's all about resetting reality, if you will. Uh, and the hard part of this, it, startups and public companies are going to take very different approaches. And does not, it's not about right or wrong. It's about what, what works with the organization. Let me give you a good example. If you are a public company, your budget is approved by the board of directors. And you go out and you do a forecast. And especially, let's say you're doing forecast after Q1. So you're in the situation we're in now. You go, you do that forecast and you say, wait a second. These things happen in Q1. We are on a completely different trajectory than we were on before. You know what? The executives, the CEO, the CFO still have to go back to the board and be accountable to what was in the original budget. If you start changing the story to say, oh, you know what? Now we're going to do something new because of this new environment and this new trajectory we're on. You're not preparing your executives to have that conversation with the board, which could get your executives in trouble. So you've got to always remember to tie back to that from a public company standpoint. From a private company standpoint, whole different story because you are owned by, you know, maybe the CEO is the whole owner, or you might just have a couple people that you're accountable to. They understand they're in the business, they're moving and they're seeing that different environment. They might look at it and say, okay, the budget we did three months ago, yeah, throw that out the window, let's start over. We gotta go and do, go off of this forecast now. So the first thing you need to understand is what environment are you in and what is leadership really looking for? One of the funny things, I, I think back to my time at Visa, when I first joined Visa, it was a not-for-profit private company. And then two years after I joined, went through the IPO, they became a for-public company. Culture around that was completely different. At the beginning, nobody cared about the budget. It was always about what are you, your, your new latest forecast and holding, holding people accountable to it. The problem that I had coming from a public company before that was that I was like, wait a second, what's the point of the budget if it has no meaning three months into the year? So, but that was because they didn't care about what they were really trying to do. They cared about how do we adjust and know where we're going. And that was the most important thing. They were in that high growth environment, not how, having to be accountable to public shareholders. Once they went public though, that culture shifted because yeah. you, know, you wanna talk about that forecast and where you're going, you still gotta tie back to the budget. So the one thing to do right now, what you, what you were asking about Rowan, is that, okay, three months in, if you're way off, what do you do? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to understand why are you off? And are you off because something happened in Q1 and it's gonna get fixed in Q2? A lot of times this could be timing. Oh, we planned on doing this huge project that we're gonna spend millions of dollars on. We we're gonna kick it off in February, but you know what, it got delayed till April. Well, now those expenses aren't in Q1 and now your Q1 looks radically different, but you're, it's just a timing thing. It's gonna come back in Q2. Nothing really to panic about. You just shift that forecast versus we have a public business, you know, or, you know, we're out there dealing with the public. Q1 went through a bunch of lockdowns because of COVID. We didn't come anywhere close to hitting our goals because we thought the economy would be more open. You're not picking that back up going through the rest of the year. So what you need to do is just make sure that you are having that story about is this going to be, is it, are we getting back to where our budget was and changing our trajectory? Do we see that coming or are we just now on a completely different growth path for the, this year and why? And the number one thing is just making sure you're being transparent and communicating that so that everybody understands. Because if you do not make, if people are thinking about it and saying, okay, we're going to hold you accountable to the budget, but you had that lockdown in Q1 that really threw off your numbers you're never going to get back to that budget number. So you need to make sure that people understand that so that you could have the best conversations going forward. Because everything about a forecast is not about what did you do. It's about where are we going and what do we need to pivot on? What decisions need to be made to take advantage of opportunities and to mitigate risks?
hopeful. Yeah, before I uh, throw over to you, Chris, uh, again, you know, for anyone uh, in the room who wants to contribute here, feel free to just raise your hand. We'd love to bring you up on stage, ask any questions that you may or may not have. Um, Chris, as, as you think about it, um, that three and nine mode, getting into where are we going, to, to, to Glenn's point, one of the things that I see a lot, uh, really high-performing finance teams, have a number of scenarios they have uh, they have you know versions of versions of their plan and they have key performance indicators that say if we miss our budget by x percent we're going to drop down to budget plan b and that's how we're going to operate the business and and that is a key part of the transparency that glenn was talking about which is if if people don't know that there's a second backup plan they're scared or they're frightened or the, you know, that's, again, it's going to shift or change the culture. Can you talk about how, uh, how you've implemented either that, that scenario management capability or, uh, or how you've just worked within the, the teams to, to drive that change as you've seen either great performance at the three and nine, nine status? Yeah, I think Glenn, Glenn, uh, uh, Glenn, you're knocking it out the park, man. I'm telling you. Like budget has always been the promise and the forecast has always been the, the, the reality. But for me in like being in SaaS businesses, right, I've seen it like two different. I've seen it like three or four different ways. Uh, prior to a SaaS business I was at before, uh, which was WebLink International that ended up getting acquired by a competitor. We always looked at things at an annual basis. We were focused on in the year, like how are we performing to the promise that we made to our investors and to our to our board, right? And we always looked at that at an annual basis. So when we got the nine plus three, we were really focused on, okay, what does the next nine months look like? And to me, one of the great things I learned in that was that our CFO and our CEO and, and working with them in that process was that they were like, look, Chris, a quarter never sets a trend, right? A quarter is just three months. That should never, that should never be super different than what you're like. You shouldn't be night and day in terms of your planning aspect of it, right? So we always looked at it and we always did a deep dive and a, 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 a quarterly business reviews where we looked at it and said, what do we do good? What do we really mess up? And uh, what, what can we uh, do better? Right. And then what, what are some opportunities in the market? So we kind of looked at it from that perspective, really looking at it from a strategic perspective uh, to I isolate those things. And then we use that to say, OK, here's what the next year looks like. That was at WebLink International. At Amarsis, it's completely different. We don't even look at, um, even, at even at WebLink before, the, the, the business before, we always looked at our SaaS contracts as like ARR. We always looked at everything from an ARR, an ACV perspective, which to ARR is annual reoccurring revenue. It's a SaaS term that it looks at your, month, uh, your monthly recurring revenue times about 12. Your annual contract values is basically, you know, your uh, MRR, which is your monthly reoccurring revenue times 12. Uh, we always looked at things at an annualized basis. When I came to Amarsis, it was a shifting to me because we look at everything on an MRR basis. So we looked at everything, customer lifetime value, everything was based on MRR. And we always looked at things to say, we're going to have the most comfort and confidence for our business in the next quarter. When we looked at, you know, Q3 and Q4, we were like, uh, you know, it, 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 we'll, we'll be directionally right in that. We were always laser focused in the next quarter. What are those things we need to do? What are those opportunities? What are those risks? What resources do we need in place? What measures do we need to hold accountability to? And then we track towards that on a, on a monthly basis as a leadership team. And we track towards that and communicated that to our employees on where we were tracking. Um, earlier today, I got off a time hall meeting where it was our entire America's uh, team for Amarsis. And we went through, uh, we didn't go through all the KPIs, we had a, a, a we, we always start our conversations with positive focus and it was talking about all the areas in the business and the leader says, oh, in projects, we're doing this and net promoter score. We're doing that new business. We hit this number existing business. We hit this number. Revenue was this dollar retention rate was that. And you share it as a positive focus of people need to go. Right. And to me, it's always that fluidity that you have to have. Right. In any plan. But to me, the most important part in that planning aspect is like you said, you have to have those, those, okay, here's what the most likely case is going to be. Here's if we crush our new business numbers, we crush our upsell cross sales, or we crush our dollar retention rate. That's this plan. If we see anything around 
you know, decreased new business performance or existing business performance or revenue projects, revenue retention rate. We'll look at those things and then we'll identify and you're tracking on those plans as you continue to go into the as you continue to go into the quarter. So for us, that's how we've always done it. And and I'm glad to get to that point because during the pandemic, it was we were we were like we were focused on the next two weeks. We weren't focused on like three months. So I'm happy to get back to quarterly forecasting planning cycles. Like let's let's give a round of applause for that because I'm I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy to get back to that because every week and every two weeks going through those cycles, but we had to do that, Rowan. Like we had to have the pulse of our business. We had to have the pulse of our people. We had to have the pulse of where we were going and how we were navigating. And when you talk about things opening up, right, that's a significant open up that now we can get to having comfort and confidence inside the quarter. So for me, those are some of the tactics and strategies uh, that we utilize in, in, in different various SaaS businesses. I'm shocked you don't want to keep running the business at a weekly level, Chris. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we come to to any questions from uh, from anyone that we've brought up on stage, uh, Glenn, do you, do you want to just follow up there on on what Chris said? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Chris Chris nailed it. When you, you got to have those various scenarios, I was like, uh, you know, my one of my favorite Yoda quotes: "Always in motion, the future is." Right? You have no idea. And to be honest with you. A lot of times, a lot of us in finance, we when we do a forecast, we think we're really smart. We, you know, we have no crystal ball though. So <laughs> rather than trying to say, you know, you have one scenario that says, here's where we're going to be, because you know what, ninety percent chance you're going to be wrong. I don't. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and I'm pretty good at forecasting, but I've never gone over and nailed it, nailed down to the. <laughs> so what you want to do is you want to have an upside scenario that goes maybe 50% better than where you think you're gonna be. In a downside scenario, that maybe goes down like 75% worse. What you know by, by doing those different scenarios is there's like a 95% chance you're gonna land somewhere in between. So you know you are covered. If you go in with one version, now all of a sudden when you miss that version, it creates panic. Oh, what are we gonna do? How are we? If you go in with an upside, downside version, and then you do your most likely, and you say, look, let's manage the most likely, but then you could pivot to one of the others. You've already solved the problems that you would have to solve for based on what, what comes up and where the market's taking you. So having those different scenarios and being able to pivot to them means that you know you're going to nail your forecast because you're gonna be somewhere in that range. Thanks. Yeah, it's so important, so important. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, Dimitri, I, I think we've got you up here on stage and I know you had your hand raised there for a little while. Did you want to, uh, introduce yourself to the, to the, to the audience and, uh, maybe ask a question or add a comment? Hi, Rowan. Thank you for uh, bringing me on stage. Thank you, Vicky, for pinging me to the room. So, um, two, two comments. One, um, Chris made some very good points. So a, a lot of useful content uh, shared through his uh, uh, notes here. So I, I, I'm going to stress one, it's simplicity. So, and I think what Chris said about simplicity, it's critical. If we don't simplify what we do and how we communicate our message and the numbers and whatever forecasts, then um, because there's so many, so many you know, people involved in decision making, and some of them might not be so um, proficient with data in terms of you know, the big data or all, all the number crunching that the finance professional might be doing. I think simplicity is critical. And the impact of whatever assumptions and scenarios that Glenn just mentioned, that's, that's the thing that we should highlight, be highlighting, you know, when we try to communicate the message, uh, tell our story to our audience. And then I, I think, and I, I want to pose like um, a question, a follow-up question on what Glenn was saying about scenarios. And my belief from my experience is that, you know, scenarios are critical and, and there's no like um, a negotiation or if, whether a company should have a scenario strategy. Uh, but I think, especially with COVID, every business should move more more towards the, the risk analysis part, you know, doing Monte Carlo simulation. And I, I would like to hear your thoughts, guys, uh, because, you know, 
a lot of the comments you shared uh, are quite interesting and i would like to see you know how you implement and um, the more dynamic scenario using risk analysis if you do that and, and how you do it and if you if you're using risk registers uh, if well, if you're correlating your inputs and, and try to come up with with a dynamic and um, analysis of what's going to happen in the future using probabilities so that's dimitris thank you for for giving the mic thanks so much to dimitri uh, uh chris glenn do you want to talk to uh how you guys are bringing in risk analysis and even potentially getting to a, a monte carlo of scenarios yeah, I mean, for me, like, I love the statistical side of and, and, and for a SaaS based business, it's less, uh, I would say, complex for multi care, uh, multi, uh, you know, um, R and, and, and things like that. But for us, one of the things <clears throat> is always around probability and seasonality. Right. And we've looked at that from a global business, uh, entity level business, a vertical business, and we've looked at different scenarios around it. So we haven't taken more of a statistic based approach. We've taken more from a business based approach on data and looking at that historical stuff that we have in different probability models, different uh, uh, seasonality trends that we look at. Also, we layer on top with, with some big data things around looking at uh, 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 customer spending. And uh, that's a big component for us. So looking at the uh, cu uh, customer price index and seeing how that's progressing, that's a big dictator from uh, how our business is gonna go. So we've, we've incorporated um, less about statistical based modeling like our and uh, Monte Carlo simulations and those things, we've looked at it for more of how do like our internal historical data also couple with uh, key uh, economic and macro environment variables impact our business and in our modeling. We do a lot of that in the budgeting process, right? Because when you look at our customer profile, a lot of people towards the later in the new year, they're less buying, budgets are pretty much used up, but we know in the first half of the year, from a seasonality perspective, that's when we should see our highest increase of new business, our highest. And then we also look at our existing business and see when the renewal dates fall. How does that correlate to the same tranche of groups that fail in that group across, you know, our EMEA operations, our APAC operations? Um, so we have a group that I partner with, which is our data sciences group out in Hungary, where they do a lot of those calculations and feed it back into the business. And, you know, I kind of go like, oh, that, that makes sense for our business. That doesn't make sense for our business or we should be looking at this variable around this organization and this specific vertical so that's where we really, really used a lot of those things in our modeling um and then also like i said coming outside the quarter that's where we're doing a deep dive of those three critical questions right what do we say we're going to do what do we do and then what are we going to do about it that's where we're really going through looking at those things so to the extent of where we use those different kind of techniques and uh, statistical techniques and, and, and planning. Um, that's how we incorporate it in our business. Yeah. It, you know, from my experience, uh, very much aligned with Chris, and because you really have to incorporate the business into your forecast. If you're focused so much on external data, you're losing sight of the business and how the business moves itself, how the, cust how the customers move, how the market moves. And, but it really depends on your company. I mean, there are there's a handful of companies out there, Coca-Cola or, you know, Procter and Gamble or something, or even a company I used to work for Visa, where you do the external market data is so incredibly important because you touch the entire global market, you know, and when you do that, you have to make sure that you're incorporating those trends. Uh, I could actually tell you a funny little story. When I was uh, head of profitability analysis for Visa, I had the chief marketing officer came to me and said, hey, I want to understand when we're doing a marketing campaign or we're out there sponsoring the Olympics, how does that impact the future volume and spend on Visa cards? And when I did the analysis, I came back to him and I, I told him, I said, you're not going to like this. And he's like, why? And I said, <coughs> in the short term, it has no impact whatsoever because what was really driving spend on Visa cards was the economy. You have more money, you spend more. You, you have less money, you spend less. It was pretty simple. And that was the biggest driver. So for that, you're doing a lot of economic analysis and looking at various trends on what's going on around with money supply, employment, um, you know, GDP, those types of things. And you're incorporating a more statistical um, model together for your forecast or, or budget. Smaller companies 
are going to be more about their unique business, how they perform, their trends, their seasonality, and what happens within those organizations more than the external market. But the tricky part is, is when you get things like COVID. You could have a small business and COVID has a huge impact on it. And then you have to look at why, what's going on. You have to bring in ex external views, but those views aren't necessarily around data that you're gonna go and plug into a statistical model. Those views are going to go more around what your assumption should be. If for example, the view is, oh, everyone's gonna be vaccinated by June and the economy is gonna get back to where it was in 2019 by August, that is one view. But then you have to go and do that scenario planning. What if it's not there? What if that's off by two months? What if it's off by five months? How are you gonna look? Those types of things, which isn't so much statistical variance, but it's more of your, your assumptions on where you think things are gonna go based on what you're seeing in the market, based on seasonality. If you happen to be a ski resort and the economy comes back in August, <coughs> or August is not one of those months that's gonna be driving your business anyway. So you have to kind of incorporate all of that into your business. Now, if you happen to be, uh, you know, a, a little league or a, a, a baseball, um, you know, organization that you're now going to have fans coming to your games, you're going to have concession sales, you're going to have more kids participating in your program, that type of thing. The economy coming back and opening up is going to have a huge impact. So you really have to take a look at how your company fits into that external market before you really determine whether or not you're going to be using those external factors. At the end of the day, what really what the business leaders are, what they're really looking for is don't tell me what the experts are, are saying and how that's going to impact our business because they don't know our business. You need to say, here's what our business is doing. And based on that external stimuli, here's where we think the range of opportunities really are going to be. Thanks so much for that, Glenn. Uh, Dimitri, I hope that answers kind of uh, your, your question or comment. One, one thing I would add to that is, is really important uh, is capturing those assumptions at the time. Um, you know, I, I, as someone who looks after a marketing department here, this year has been planning for this year has been a huge challenge thinking about, you know, live events, right? We, we see um, a, a general uh, sense of, kind of excitement around getting back to live events and people want to come to live events, but they don't want to go to really big ones. And so as, as we were planning the year in, in December and, and November, looking at oh, what, which events do we want to go to? And, and the, you know, that has a huge impact on our, on our budget. We have to start to document all of that, working with the finance team to say, hey, we're not going to do this event this year because we don't believe it will be, you know, in the capacity that we want and won't have the intention, blah, blah, blah. Well, now that things are potentially recovering faster, we've got to go back and look at those assumptions and say, hey, we built this budget on some assumptions at a set of, you know, at a point in time and coming back to the forecasting that we were talking about earlier. Maybe now is the time to start going back to those things. Is, is that something that we want to do as a business? What's the, going to be the ROI? How do I get more investment? Because at the time, I didn't think that they were going to happen. Now they may happen. I just don't know. And, and, and so that period of time has, has elapsed. And, and as a business leader, I'm sitting here with a new set of assumptions, looking at an old set of assumptions and trying to adjust my forecast against a budget that was built with assumptions set, set A, and now I've got assumption set B. And that's where, you know, we've talked a lot on, on FP&A Fridays about, you know, I need my FP&A team to help me understand the impact of those decisions right now and how we can, you know, look to go and, you know, whether it's secure more budget or make more changes or, or adjust, you know, uh, my, my expenditure to, to accommodate that, that big change. And, and that's something that, you know, I need a partner on. Yeah, actually, if I could add one thing to that, Rowan. So when you go through it as a business leader, that is exactly the decision, you know, you, you just described your mindset and saying, I need help on this. Your FP&A person should go over and look at what you have and say, here's how we can pivot. Well, here's where we can make some trade-offs. You were planning on doing some of these things. What if we do that to free up funds so that you could do these other things? The challenging part is the company, and you talked about Grant earlier as, as the CEO, Grant is accountable to the board that he has to go over, make sure that you're still, the company 
delivering on those results. So it's not just, hey, look, things are opening up. Let's go spend a bunch of money because if there's no revenue to offset it, Grant's <laughs> going to miss his numbers. So it's about how do you go over and work that into that bigger perspective? And a lot of times it's trade-offs. And you could, you could, maybe you had in the budget to say, hey, we were planning on hiring somebody in June. You know what? Maybe now you put that hire off until September. You take the funds that you allocated to comp. Now that frees it up. So now you can go over to a particular event. You do things like that. It's it's what are those things that you can pivot on and adjust? And where's that flexibility? One other thing I'm going to throw out there. And when people are doing budgets, I always like this concept, especially when you, you don't do this at an individual cost center level, but you do it at more like, you know, a, a chief marketing officer level growing, you know, where you are is that when you put your budget together to go and say, look, I'm going to have my budget that I'm going to communicate to my team and say, here, guys, here's what we're going to manage to. But then as long as you could keep it within your overall expenses, you put this little uh, contingency pool in, a, in an account that you're never going to use. <laughs> and it's, hey, when things come up, if someone comes to me and says, I need 10 grand to go and do this, you can then decide as that business leader to say, hey, you know what? Okay, I'm going to go and do it. If you put those numbers in the budget and you have to pull it, pull back on it, everyone feels like you're taking something away from them. But if you have this little pool of funds. Don't your, tell everyone about my slush fund, Glenn. You've just yeah, revealed it on the Glenn, podcast. Glenn, you're telling that, you're, you're <laughs> Glenn, you are letting the secrets out. Everybody's going to know that we have good guys in our plans all the time. <laughs> No, I, by the way, and this doesn't always happen, you can't do it. But the bigger thing is, is that when you need to make cuts, that's the pool you go to so you don't touch the rest of that budget. And so have, building in that flexibility and having those different pivot points really helps you as a business leader have that flexibility you need when things come up that you weren't expecting. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I actually did a podcast with uh, with um, a Peter Mahoney of a company called Planner around you know how marketing should think of those exactly those sorts of scenarios, and it's a really important uh, uh, strategy for a marketing department specifically because you're always going to have uh, you know uh, opportunistic things that you want to invest in and that you never could have planned for before. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the other flip side is um, thankfully our, our budgets are really dynamic in the way that we spend money is really dynamic, right? It's not always all headcount. Um, Google takes a lot of it. Facebook takes a lot of it. And, and we can uh, we can dial them up and back as we need to and, and, and monitor the performance. So that's also really helpful as a leader is, is how we can get that frequent feedback from, from places like that. Um, and uh, it, it's certainly something that, you know, within the team as well, I, you know, I'll, I'll take it that a step further, Glenn, is within the team, we have to create a high performance culture, even at my level with my team to say, hey, team, we made some assumptions on a set of investments. If they're not working, I am going to move money around. It's not personal, it, you know, and, and that then comes back to maybe a, a topic for a, a future conversation, which is how are our commission and bonus plan structured? Well, guess what? They're, they're not tied to anything other than company revenue. So the team don't really get upset if I move money around when it's very transparent. It's done in a way that says, hey, the best outcome for the business here is to move, you know, from channel A to channel B. I know that hurts you personally because you wanted to spend that money somewhere, but ultimately it's better for you and your bonus plan if uh, if we hit our numbers by investing in high performing channels. That's probably another conversation for another Friday with only 12 minutes left. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it, it is, but I'm going to add one thing on there. When you talked about how you have Facebook or Google and you have those budgets, one of the things I did when I was at, as a Charles Schwab was we evaluated what was the investment in each of those and what were we were looking to get. We we're looking to get, you know, clicks or, you know, time on a certain page or number of pages that were viewed on the website, those types of things. And you're looking for that engagement. And you should know which ones have bigger impacts than others to make sure that if you're going to dial one of those back to do something else, you're going to get a better return on that investment. And in that aspect, and it, you're right, this is a topic for, for another session, but it's incorporating those business metrics and that analysis and how it connects into the financials. And it's where you could connect all those dots that, F, that your FP&A partner should be drive, helping you drive that conversation and bringing that transparency to your team. So when you say, hey, we're going to dial this back, 
everyone understands. Yeah, you know what? That makes sense because we're going to get more bang for a buck over here. Definitely. It's, it's the classic, guys. It's the classic pivot or persevere, right? And when you're going through high growth, right, you're making all these investments, you're placing all these bets, and you're like, do we do we continue to, to pivot? Do we continue to persevere in the strategy we're going down, or do we pivot? And uh, to your point earlier, uh, Glenn, that you were mentioning with uh, the placeholders, right? I love having – I call them good guys, right? And I have these – I have, usually have these good guys put into, like – expense line items where i'm just like it's like other or like other operational expenses right uh but yeah as, as leaders man and that, and that's the that's the fundamental thing right it's not always about the debits and credits and now don't get me wrong that's super important you have yeah. to know it because that's going to be the baseline that you're making these pivot and persevere conversations on so you have to have a hundred percent foundation of your tactical operations but you know, it, to me, it, it's it's like it, it's constantly that investment, that ROI that you're. Ca- and a lot of times with me, and I, I don't know for you, Glenn, but for me, I'm making, I'm placing a lot of those bets, and it's not having all the, it's not having the complete data, it's not having the complete picture, it's not knowing all the relative risks. You're placing bets and just saying, you know what, I, you know, I can see this, and sometimes you get them wrong, right? But you learn from that aspect of it, so. I think to all the listeners and people thinking, you don't always have to have all the information, the full context. Sometimes you got to make those persevere and pivot placement conversations of investments. You got to just make them. You got to take the risk and uh, you got to be conscious about it. You're not making million dollar bets that you don't have information on. But a lot of times a business that's moving so fast, you've got to just place those bets and just say, you know what? Here's what we're going out with. Here's what we're going to do. But here's the cadence that we're going to evaluate if this was a good bet or a bad bet. Yeah, exactly. And the one thing you want to do is when you're doing your budgets or you're doing your forecast, however you're going to be held accountable, you want to create as much flexibility in that as possible. You know, it's going to be the CFO is going to say, hey, you know, Rowan, as the head of marketing, here is how much money we're going to give to you to spend. How you allocate that spend is a whole different thing. And that's where FP&A should be going and helping you to create as much flexibility in there as possible to give you the control and power. This way, you know, you don't want to get to a point where you, you're in a contract, you have to go and spend it. Now your hands are tied and you don't have the funds to go over and make things happen. So Chris is absolutely right. You, there are times you just got to go in and you say, look, we got 60% of the information ideally we'd want to have. We're going to go and make a bet on this. But give yourself that flexibility to say, we're going to try it for a month, but you know what? We're going to pull that back if it turns out it's not going the direction we want. Fact. FP&A facts. Yep. The, um, the, the other thing that is really important for, uh, for the business leaders listening, not just uh, the, the FP&A folks is, and maybe this is something helpful for the FP&A folks from my perspective, which is, not everything can be measured in uh, such a short-term modality, right? There's things that, you know, a marketing organization, a sales organization, uh, you know, a CS organization, they're going to need to make investments now. And some of those may pay off in the short term, some may pay off in the near term, and others may pay off in the long term. It's making sure that everyone is aware <laughs> as to what is the, the near-term bet, the, the uh, mid-term, the long-term bets are. And also allowing um, to say, you know, back to that kind of the slush fund, the good guys, right? You don't get that unless 80% of what you're doing is actually measurable and performing and, and getting you to where you need to be. Otherwise, every dollar is being fought for and should be fought for and should be accounted for. Um, you get to keep the little slush fund if if the business is performing and if your numbers are tying out and you're achieving what you need to achieve, because otherwise everything should be up for grabs in terms of trying to allocate to that, that high performing channel and course correcting the business. Definitely. You should also be looking at and saying, Hey, internally, how do you go and run that business more efficiently? And you might look at it and say, you know what, if I lose somebody, I'm not necessarily going to replace them. And then you take that money and that's how you create some of those funds because it's in your budget. You had the person, but you could say we could do this without, you know, if, if the, you know, if Fred Flintstone leaves the company, hey, you know, what, I'm going to take Fred's comp and now I'm going to use it and allocate in other ways. I don't necessarily need to backfill Fred or maybe even backfill Fred at his level. 
right? You could go over, maybe downgrade it, free up funds that way. That's what I'm talking about with that flexibility that, that you really want to make sure that you have. Definitely. Absolutely. So I know we're uh, we're almost at the top of the hour, and uh, unfortunately, we have day jobs because we could uh, we could keep this going all day. I'm sure, gents. Um, all day. <laughs> so you know, to to just recap for everyone, today's focus has really been about how how we can create that that high performance culture through some of these FP&A techniques, and and we've talked about you know forecasting, uh, budget and variance analysis versus forecasting variance analysis, and just leverage that kind of meeting the business where they are uh, to do that. And so I'd love to, uh, to, to thank everyone uh, the listening here on Clubhouse. Uh, for those that aren't on Clubhouse, 10 a.m. every Fridays, FP&A Fridays, please join us. Love to have your participation like we saw today. And, uh, and Chris and Glenn, uh, thank you both for, for, the, uh, for the session today. Have a uh, great weekend. Chris, you'll be at the boxing gym, probably at the normal gym. And uh, <laughs> Glenn, Glenn, I know, is, uh, you know, going to be enduring the weather on Sunday. So thanks, gents. Uh, really appreciate it. Have a, uh, have a great weekend. And uh, this is the Being Planful podcast, FP&A Fridays on Clubhouse. Thanks, everyone. Have Thank you. Week. Have a great weekend. Glenn, you're the man. You too, guys. <laughs>